Welcome to a very special edition of ACF Chefs Forum. We are so excited to see you in New Orleans for ACF National Convention, and so wanted to start the education and networking in advance for all of us traveling to the Big Easy. We appreciate you tuning in today for this webinar and hope that you are ready to learn as we shine the light on a very accomplished chef and hospitality professional today. Before we begin, as a note, we wanna hear from you. Please use the chat function to collaborate with other chefs tuning in and the Q&A function anytime to pose questions to today's featured speaker, which will be answered at the end of the presentation. All right, so let's get that conversation going in the chat. If you haven't already, please let us know where you're tuning in from today. I'm Jackie Pressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships, and I'm honored to introduce Chef Lawrence T. McFadden, CMC, who for over 30 years has served in various capacities with global world-class hospitality organizations. Starting his career as an executive chef, he was positioned in key hospitality titles, eventually assuming general manager for both hotels and private clubs. His impressive career includes corporate and key leadership positions in iconic brands and properties, many of which have been awarded Michelin or Mobile recognition such as the Ritz-Carlton, MGM, the Greenbrier, Waldorf Astoria, and Shangri-La Hotels. I could really go on and on. He's such an accomplished professional. He is so full of wisdom. I, I know that Master Chef McFadden is excited to start his presentation. So at this time, I'll pass the session over to him. Thanks again for joining us today, Chef. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this process. Uh, ACF has been a uh, special uh, organization for me my entire career for 35 years. Um, and we'll speak a little bit about that. Um, I was asked to come and talk to all of you um, on behalf of um, the brand that I work for now, Coppler, Keebler & Wallace, uh, in partnership with my uh, partner in food and beverage, Annette Whitley, uh, Annette brings 20 years of experience and I bring 35 years of experience and we have an opportunity to crisscross the nation and parts of the globe talking about food and beverage, um, the values of um, the values that we have um, and um, what it what it means to be a chef today in today's profession. Um, uh, I joined in 1982, uh, went through the apprenticeship in 1985 at the Greenbrier, and I'm so excited to see that um, at that time, an associate's degree or an apprenticeship or learning on the job were, were simply enough. Today, um, master's degrees, PhDs, and really have educated, and that's the strategic thinking the strategic requirements, the leadership uh, qualities um, that the executive chef and the culinary profession brings forward. Um, and I really wanted to take you on that journey today in partnership with my brand, KKNW, and my partner, Annette, as we uh, speak to different audiences and stakeholders. In today's agenda, I'd really like to talk to you about uh, the bar, uh, menu, branding, and when I think of branding, I think of your individual chef's brand, career, culture, what is a culinary culture, how is it created, why do some organizations have great culinary cultures, catering, the emerging customer, and the changing customer dynamics, marketing, and then what is the restaurants of 2023, um, which we know that food and beverage has always been part of the entertainment business, but never more today with the Food Network, with celebrity chefs, has our industry been more engaged with more requirements so today we're going to talk a little bit, like I sp spoke quickly, uh, bar, menu, brand, career, culture, catering, customer, marketing, and restaurants in the process. Um, today's audience, probably we've got some general managers, human resources, food and beverage chefs, finance, catering, and students. Um, so you can see the, the wide scale of people that influence 
the culinary services, uh, wherever you are. Um, all of these are in partnership. Um, executive committee meeting members, um, uh, colleagues, um, in some cases, students. Often the chef is the student to some of these people uh, in the process. I wanted to talk a little bit about generational dining. Today, when so a group, a, a group, a family, a clan, a, a, um, a tribe sit down, this is the reality. Uh, the daughter-in-law might be microbiotic. A granddaughter might be vegan. The grandfather might be still meat and potatoes, and the son is organic sourced. So when a chef is asked to create a menu, um, where do they begin? Um, there are values and there are uh, norms in our industry. Uh, food prepared well, Escoffier would say 50% of the recipe is really the ingredient that it's sourced. Buying quality ingredients, fabricating less than necessary, and really just seasoning it nicely in the in the in the elements of the spring or seasonal goes a long ways to the fabrication in pleasing all of these portfolios and palettes. But it's interesting whenever I'm spe speaking to a club, and normally with a club, they'll say to me, Chef McFadden, um, we'd like to have a little bit more consistency of our product. We'd like to have um, a little more creativity in our menus. Um, we'd like to have a, a person who teaches, who educates. Um, those are three of the top values that we ask. So when I when I hear consistency, I say, well, is there a recipe Bible? Is there a process and procedure that people follow? When it comes to consistency, uh, excuse me, when it comes to creativity or innovation, I always ask them one simple question because that's the same audience that's sitting at this table, the four people. I say, do you like what's in your refrigerator every day? And they always laugh and they say, no, we don't. And so welcome to the emotion of food. And I really haven't thought about lunch until sometimes I sit down. So a chef must be progressive, educating and use the process. We think about food probably more than anything in the day. Not breakfast. Breakfast are really not where you get creative. Breakfast is normally, in many of you, Diet Coke has passed coffee um, and energy drinks have passed coffee as the morning beverage, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how people look at it. Um, but it's usually some type of a caffeine jolt or a smoothie or something that the body is used to. Um, lunch is where people start saying, okay, I might venture out, and then sometimes on dinner. But I really talk about the value of the executive chef. And the value of the executive chef is that people want your product. This is a beautiful piece of salmon um, done by the chef that was at our club. Um, interesting enough, probably 40 years ago, it would not have been served medium rare. Now today, because of sushi, and trends, people will actually even try it. And salmon is the number one fin fish sold in America now, everybody. And that's also because it's moist. There's a large window of, of margin when somebody cooks a piece of salmon now. Um, it probably replaced the cod or the haddock of a generation before. When we talk about your brand, I always talk to chefs about what is your brand? Employees buy your brand. They say that employees leave people before they leave organizations. Whenever a chef or an organization tells me that they have recruiting challenges, I always ask, where are they involved in the community? Where are they involved in the industry? Where are they creating a buzz? Are they the back door for people to learn in their organizations? Um, but I always find that the most confident chefs who have a good grasp of recruiting and, and strategies are normally the ones that are still practicing their craft, 
not only just cooking, but involved in lots of different aspects of the industry. They're involved in education. They're involved in community. They're involved in philanthropic. They're involved in the technique of the craft. They're really an artisan and a craftsman of the industry, and they love it. So don't underestimate that while the Ritz-Carlton or the Four Seasons or a club are brands that people aspire to work with, they also want to work with individuals and learn from those individuals. And so that's the individual brand that I talk to about the chefs. One of the things that is created or one of the things that an individual should look at is what is my personal mission statement? And write down where are the things that are non-negotiable in my life, health and wellness, provider of my family and others economically, lifetime learning. So if I'm a lifetime learner and we talk about that with certification, we talk about that with um, uh, education, we talk about that with experiences. Um, if you're a lifetime learner and you're constantly learning, you're probably going to economically grow. If you're economically growing, you're probably providing for yourself and for your family in the process. And wellness and health is really important in today's world. A chef has, a culinary, culinary person has, a large portion of their life is on their feet. That's not going to change, ladies and gentlemen. So with that, there needs to be a mindfulness that I take care of myself. And we can talk about work-life balance, and we can talk about less hours, but we can also talk about the fact that we must care for ourselves because we are not sedentary. This is a very active lifestyle as a chef. Um, it will not change a tremendous amount unless robotics comes into the play, unless you get into uh, manufacturing, potentially. If you're in research and development, okay, or flavor profiling, or a dietitian, perhaps. But even with that, it's still an act of wellness, taking care of yourself mentally. But all of this, health and wellness, also is what do you ingest? Are you eating a healthy lifestyle? Are you taking care of yourselves? in the process. We are role models as executive chefs, as food and beverage professionals for ourselves and for others, for our families to know what is in food, how is it prepared, and what is the right mix of those products to take care and sustain us as human beings. So we have a lot of responsibility as executive chefs not to just say what we do and do as we do, but to actually walk the talk in the process. And what I have found in many of my mentors, many of the mentors that I learned from as culinarians or business people also had a balanced scorecard, which is what we're talking about here a little bit, which is health, wellness, education, provider for myself, and of course, a little bit of the spiritual wellness as well which is not underestimated, which is to care for others greater than I care for myself sometimes. Leadership. We talk about leadership all the time, chefs, and we talk about what is the difference between a manager and a leader. There are 300 leadership books that are written every single year. People are in love with the term leader, but they don't often know what that means. Kind of like, well, he's a great leader or he's a great mentor. What do those things mean? Leaders that I have been exposed to that have been people that have shaped our industry, they had a vision. They had a mission for themselves and the organization. They had strong morality. They were recruiters in the sense that they were influencers. Many of those people as recruiters would tell me where I needed my next step. You need to go work th with this person. And they would gift me to someone else. I had, I had to have the courage to say yes, but they were gifting me to a colleague who would take care of me. And that was how a lot of industry works, regardless of culinary. Those individuals were risk takers. They took a risk with me 
they saw something in me and they 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 achieved that and they supported that when somebody asks of your reference there's a risk to that will that person work out leaders don't worry about that risk they know in their heart that this person if given the right opportunities will provide for that organization persuasion that's what i was talking about with a little bit of recruiters a great leader persuades you that this is what's in your best interest and what's in the best interest of the organization the balance scorecard the stakeholders consensus they don't tell you what to do they ask you what to do asking means that you have questions when you ask when i tell you to do something that's a little bit of a juvenile approach that could be take your hand out of the oven you're going to burn it i'm not going to ask you i'm going to tell you but great leaders ask you they want to build consensus because when they ask you have an opportunity to say why as Simon Sinek would say, and you have to say why, and then you have to have the answer as that mentor or the leader to say, why did I ask you to do this? Because of this. And you may not know why I'm telling you that until maybe years later, but asking is a professional approach. And then a great leader has emotional intelligence, meaning that when they have made a mistake, they're the first to apologize. When they when they do um, slip, which wisdom is built on mistakes? I've had limited, limitless mistakes in my career. I also had the ability to learn from those, but high emotional intelligence are some of the qualities. So when you look at these things as an individual, as an individual, do you care for others? Do you like recruiting? Do you understand that your role as an executive chef or a culinarian is to recruit not only at the line level, I'm sorry, not only at the executive chef, but even at the line level, I'd like to bring a friend to this organization. Ethics, I'm not going to say much about this, but ethics is enough said you treasure your brand. We only have a few chances at our brand. Culture. What is your member value proposition? I use this in the club, but I talk about culture. Culture for a lot of culinary cultures is trust. Does your organization trust the product? Are you an authority in that area? Not an expert, an authority in understanding that this is the right way to prepare something in the process. And so culinary cultures, there's a few things I ask about in clubs when I say, do you have a culinary culture? It normally starts with, was there an iconic executive chef in the role for many, many years? One of the great clubs that I think about and one of the great colleagues that I have so much respect for is a Keith Kokenauer at the Duquesne Club. The Duquesne Club has a culinary culture and it started before Keith but he joined, Chef Kokenauer joined, and 30 years later, he was at the helm. The Duquesne Club was a place where you went in, if you were at Pica or if you were in Pennsylvania or you were anywhere, you would go work in his kitchen. He was innovative in his product. He was involved in the community and association. So I ask sometimes, what is the culinary culture of your kitchen? because all of these things play a part and members can feel that. And so do they trust your product and are you the authority in that area? Does your club, does your own team know what your values are? As I said, people work for the executive chef. Do they trust you as a leader? Do you walk the talk? We talked about the leadership super qualities, but as a human being, do you have time and open door policy? And it's interesting because you said, well, it's interesting that Lawrence was going to talk about trends and fads of food and beverage, and now he's talking. It all starts with the person at the helm. What is your personal mantra? What is your professional mantra? 
What do I believe in? Do I seek the greatest good of others? Do I really want to educate in the process? Because long before you get to trends, the person who runs the organization is the hub of the talent that that individual or that organization collects in intellectual properties and so forth like that. What are the executive chef roles? So let's talk a little bit. Not job descriptions. That's different. That's the task that you do, what you're going to be accountable for. First and foremost, as you become an executive chef, as you grow through the ranks, many of you might be students. Many of you may be educators. You are the principal expert in your area often. That means you are, just like the HVAC or the engineer, understand that the language that you use needs to be broken down in bite-sized pieces, but you are an expert. As an executive chef, you're an expert. You're a strategic partner, meaning that just because you cook certain things that you like doesn't mean that they are the items that the customer wants to eat or that they're profitable. So you have to be the strategic partner to massage the planning of your kitchens. You are a brand extension. The minute you walk out of the four walls of your employment, you are walking into a culinary school. You're walking into a community. You're doing something for nonprofit. You're doing something for philanthropic. You extend that brand. You have to take care of that. Ladies and gentlemen, it may not be important to you but I would say that the chef's coat is one of the most iconic, and the chef's toque, if you still wear it, or a hat, is one of the most iconic symbols of our industry. If you decide to wear that to a bar, if you decide to wear that to somewhere else, understand that the brand is being affected because that's not where the chef was meant the chef's jack was, me was meant to be worn. So think about that as you're emerging professionals. While it might be more comfortable just to leave your uniform on, your uniform plays a part and it identifies. And we're very, in the culinary industry, we need to be very proud of this because a lot of organizations have gotten rid of all types of uniforms for all other positions. It's hard to determine who the director of finance is. It's hard to determine who the front desk manager is. It's hard to determine sometimes even who the engineer is. But the chef still has an iconic uniform. Please consider that when you are migrating from point to point, that we are very fortunate and very proud because of all the ladies. And we are a communicator. We are a responsibility to take that. These are the roles and responsibilities. So when we're recruiting for people, these are what members, we are data seekers and we are taskmasters. Ladies and gentlemen, you still have to get the job done. You have to get it done with style and grace, but you have to get it done. The general manager in a culinary culture is really, really driven by the relationship between the general manager, the trust, the unconditional support, but clear communication from the executive chef. Ladies and gentlemen and, and audience, you have a responsibility to communicate up to your boss. You have a responsibility to communicate to him or her what are your needs as an executive chef so you can follow your roles. The food and beverage is to keep the GM informed. The F&B, um, the, the executive chef is to keep them informed. And there's a mutual respect and an unconditional clear communication. Food and beverage roles, responsibilities. The food and beverage person, your partner, is interesting enough, a principal expert, a strategic partner, but the voice of the customer, a brand extension of the division and a communicator, and a data evaluator. So interesting enough when we talk about, often they say, can an executive chef be a food and beverage director? Absolutely. Should we merge those two positions together to save 
um, rev, uh, to save costs. Okay, if the person has the right skill set, which we talked a little bit about, that vision, mission, and all those. But interesting enough, look how closely they're aligned in the process. So they're not that different. They still have the, but they have different roles and responsibilities, but still the same values in that. Today, the executive chef role is changing a little bit. Before it used to be um, executive chef. Now it's director uh, and director of food and beverage, and they over, oversee the entire thing. The old one would have been executive chef just in charge of the silo. Ladies and gentlemen who are on this role, that are looking at their roles in the process, executive chefs, please understand you're going to be asked to do more and more and more. And you say, well, that's because they're trying to cut costs. No, it's because we have greater reach in the process. And please take a look at that as you put those together and oversee the entire business. Certification, the ACF, my probably when people ask me, they said, you've worked a lot of places. Um, where do you find the most satisfaction? My satisfaction is to be educated. Because when I was a general manager and I sat at the board meeting with people with law degrees, medical degrees, financial degrees, I felt very strong that I had a degree. I had a certified master chef degree. I had an associate's degree. And I had a few other things as well. And I always felt very proud that I had achieved something. And that's what the ACF is. And the certification is the kryptonite to the fact that unfortunately, Ladies and gentlemen, anybody can open up a restaurant. Anybody can call themselves a chef and they can go to practice, which is fine. But not everybody can call themselves a certified executive chef. So it's very important when we recruit because it's part of that lifetime learning that we talk about is the fact that did somebody continue to educate themselves? Did somebody com continue to get certification? Did somebody continue to move forward in their education? I'm always looking in resumes and so forth. Is somebody continuing to educate themselves? What are the value propositions of the food and beverage department that you're in charge of? Consistency and excellence. Simplicity in the ingredients and the process technical proficiency, engagement with all the stakeholders, that might be an owner, that might be an employee, that might be a colleague, it might be a customer, it might be a member, it might be someone in the community. Authentic from the heart, meaning that you are trying to put together the most authentic product, a language of quality, how do you explain your product, wordsmithing, crafting your, your message, Humanities is probably lost in some cases, but ladies and gentlemen, chefs, directors of food and beverage, and to be able to communicate, be able to communicate and write will be the success of your future. If you cannot write a message, if you cannot write a business case, if you cannot communicate your needs to the customers that are gonna make the decision, you will limit your potential of growth as an executive chef. So while you will always be an artisan, understand it has to be matched and coupled with the strategies of business, leadership, and growth. You, know, you need to be business-centric, meaning that while not everything is going to make the same amount of profit, the business of being in business is to make money. And so a lot of people believe that they want to take care of the world and set their set the world on fire. And then they forget that I need to cook what the person wants. I need to cook what sells. I need to evaluate that in the data. I have to take care of the members. I have to do it in a portion and a price that's specific to that. I need to purchase properly and I need to use data to make the decisions and help remove some of 
the emotion of the process. And then ultimately, as I said earlier, you're there to create trust. If your customer doesn't have trust in the product, you're probably going to go out of business or you're going to have to move on to something else in the process. So the value proposition that the food and beverage and the culinary team brings to the organization are in some of these pillars that we talked about today. Consistent product, simplicity blended with creativity, authentic hard engagement, entrepreneurial vision, and again, creating trust. A culture of excellence, a leader must be an industry partner. You notice that I keep on talking about the complete, and I know that a lot of you speak and a lot of you work and a lot of you experience seven days a week, you experience six days a week, you experience 12 hours a day, and you say that I just don't have time to do anything else. Yes, there are windows of time with that. But don't, don't lose sight of the fact that you must be a leader in our industry. We count on you to represent and push our industry forward. Um, the department must have an employee promise, which means that you're taking care of and promising your employees that you will educate them, that you will care for them, that you will pay them fairly, that you will, will create succession plan for him. Public relations and press and marketable. Chefs, you have to be able to be press savvy. You have to be able to provide product so that the customers can read about it. You must participate in community visibility. If there is a young culinary school there and they need a um, industry chef, to judge their examination, then you volunteer. If you're involved, all of you must be involved in the ACF Association. Regardless of if you have time, our industry, our certification, our, our entire process of our industry is hinged on the fact that we must be part of the association. That's non-negotiable. Um, now, you may be involved in it more than others. You may be a president for several years and really wear yourself out, but you have to stay a member. You must have a voice on social responsibilities, um, not to the point where you become contradictive to your brand, but you do have to have an opinion about the truth and labeling or so forth. And then you must be you must produce disciples. You would be amazed at the number of people. The greatest question I ask people when they're interviewing for a job is, give me an example of someone who's doing better than when they, doing better today than when they arrived with you. And it could be something like a dishwasher and it could be, but these are all trends for, for many of you who might've thought, well, I'm gonna listen about the latest molecular gastronomy, I'm going to talk to you about the trends of, of, of professionalism before we get to those. In creating disciples is the greatest thing a mentor can do because every one of us were handed to someone else or educated by someone else. So we must pollinate the industry on a regular basis. If you're interviewing, and this may be for some of you, and many of you have been a part of this, but the interview process, many of us weren't taught how to interview. If your organization is using a PI, a Plotkins, a DISC, a Talent Plus, you have a better chance of selecting the person who has the core values of the organization. There are certain values and characteristics. Norman Van Aken would say to us that the industry selects us, we don't select the industry. I would have to say that's true because if you give from the heart, if you enjoy taking care of people, if you like moving heaven and earth and taking care of people and cooking for people and so forth, there's a chance you're gonna be successful. The Talent Plus or PI or 
Plotkins or other discs can evaluate whether you have certain the a certain of these natural characteristics in your personality. That helps when you as an executive chef or director of food and beverage are selecting someone to just speak to somebody about their professional professional abilities. That's one piece. But to actually find out what their characteristics are and what their potentials are is really something even further more. This is a kind of a tongue in cheek, but past employee practices. The beatings will continue until the mor morale improves. The employees are the most important resource to the service commitment. My management must continue to change. My approach, my language, how I address things must change and evolve because people have a required ethical, moral philosophy that we must make our industry better than those who came before us. And while unfortunately some of the media and some of the networks show maybe less than a strategy of communication or dumb us down with profanity or the way we verbally tone ourselves, that's unfortunate. We must be the leaders in the ACF and all of us, we must be the leaders as we move forward with style and grace, empathy, now, let me, let me make sure it's very clear. Excellence doesn't come without demand, but demand can be done with excellence. Nothing happened that wasn't a lot of hard work, but it doesn't mean it has to be demeaning. But it does have to be focused, and it does have to be tasked. For me to say to you that getting at a good level can be done easily. No, it can't be. It has to be practiced over and over and over. It has to be corrected. We have to make mistakes. We have to be told of our mistakes. But how we handle those mistakes, both ourselves and those of others, is the difference between whether or not our culture has moved forward in the kitchen. And what we don't want from any of us is people who don't want to be part of a profession anymore. The customer, who are they and what do they want? That was what I talk about with data a little bit, or trends, is that we must look at the customer and what do they want. So the luxury customer today has a couple of super norms. I talk about this in the club business and the luxury business, but DIY, involve me, do it yourself. Customers want to be involved. Martha Stewart did this for us years ago. Cooking stations. Cooking stations are one of the greatest ways for you to educate and engage your customers. Long gone are the chafing dishes. Now it's action stations, interacting, involve me in it. Let me see it being prepared. Let me see the product. Unique experiences. Tell them about an ingredient that's being used. Time, which is the speed of the product. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're not doing a time and motion study for your menus and you don't look at every one of the items and say, if I can't do from fire to finish within eight minutes, you're not going to ever deliver it fast enough because the internet has already whipped up the speed of our customers to a point where it's almost unreasonable. But you must look at Am I preparing a menu that I can execute quickly? Now, there's other ways to do this as well. Sous vide, slow cooking, cryovac. You can sous vide a perfect piece of chicken now and just sear it off on the, and so a chicken that used to take 25 or 30 minutes can now be done in eight to 12 minutes with a beautiful skin and a moist internal. There is technique that is done now with um, with um, uh, the, the different ovens and so forth like that. So welcome to innovation meets currency of time. Sensational descriptors, and we'll talk about that a little bit now in, in the next slide. Authentic offerings. 
no longer is it good enough for you just to say it's tacos. You must tell them exactly where the masa came from. You have to tell them what products are there. Is there epizote in there? Is there cilantro in there? Is there a certain pepper in there? Where does that come from? People want to know that they're eating authentic food. You must be uber organized, ladies and gentlemen, meaning that the buffet or so forth must be organized. Grab and goes must be organized. Star Starbucks. And then repeatable learnings, meaning that if they come to the club or if they come to your restaurant or they come somewhere and they have something with you, they want to tell their friends over coffee the next day. You're not going to believe we went to this biodynamic wine. They had this thing. The quartz was was with that and they had a horn that was buried in next to the and blah, blah, blah. They want to tell a story. They want repeatable learnings. And this is the super customer. These are the norms of the luxury customer. They're no longer just eating. Now, do they expect consistency? Yes. Do they expect quality? Yes. But these are some of the things that they will they will really engage them if you do these things. Descriptor, descriptors. Young chefs, young executive chefs, young from there has come a sensation of not just describing, there's terms like, it's no longer just good, it's epic. Um, it was amazing as opposed to good. There's no longer just, dinner was good. There are things like, I was speechless, or to die for, or you dump salt. The things people have said about my food over the last 20 years, service was horrible. Get used to the fact that it's not personal. This is just how they're trying to describe their experience because good or it didn't agree with me anymore or it was okay isn't good enough. They have to really go to extremes to describe it. Don't take it personally if it's negative and don't get too high if it's something positive because they've gone over the extreme because they're judging themselves sometimes more so than the food. But I've heard things and I wrote a few down. One lady told me that I stole two, two hours of her life one time. And I thought to myself, how could cooking for you have stolen two hours? I obviously didn't make her happy. That's okay. But I couldn't take it personally. I could only inflect on the fact that she wasn't happy. How could I make her happy? But I don't think she meant exactly what she said, but she needed to say that. So young professionals out there, you're entering into an industry, you're entering into an emotional piece that is no longer just it was good or no, not good. People are really describing things on the extremes. Please understand it's not personal. When I was talking about grab and go at my restaurant, a picture is a thousand words. And I told my, my club I wanted to open up a Starbucks. They said, Lawrence, we don't do Starbucks. I said, what about if the Starbucks look like this? So use chef and, 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 and professionals, use pictures as a thousand words to help people take them on a journey. This was a beautiful, beautiful um, restaurant that we built in Berlin. They took they took apart a 200-year restaurant and they rebuilt it in the middle of Potsdamer Platz in the Ritz-Carlton Berlin. And they put together this beautiful bistro. As soon as I saw this picture, my house committee said, yes, okay, now we know what you want. I had to describe to them what I meant by a Starbucks and a grab and go in the quality of our beautiful club. Menus. Can a menu be everything to everyone? And I know that's a bit of a tongue in cheek, but welcome to what I just told you about the fact that every club says to me, could the chef be a little bit more innovative? Could we have a little bit more selections? And I always remind them simply that there are there are value strategies. Cheesecake Factory, a large menu. That's their strategy. Maybe not always the best quality, but a lot of selections. McDonald's, value proposition on every corner. Cheap, put in a bag. 
but a limited menu. So when I start to share with them, what would you like your club to be like and how would you like it to be? If I use some examples of, 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 of brands, they get a better idea. But no, it can't be everything to everyone. But data will tell you if you're hitting the majority. And chefs, it's not just the innate conversation. It is what sells. It how it sells in the modifiers that it comes in with the sales. So again, when we talk about menus, I talked about it. There are menus of variety. There are menus of price. There are menus of location. There are menus of speed. There are members of hours and there is members of approachability. And I always ask the club, which one are you? Well, we want everything, Lawrence. I understand. But you have to have one. And then you can't not pay attention to the others, but you can't be everything. And if, if you break this down, ladies and gentlemen, they start to understand because they're talking. Oh, sometimes we talk. So here is the customer needs. Here is the your product. And here is the marketplace of the competition. And your value, value proposition is where those three circles fit. And that's where the club is or your restaurant. You can't be everything to everyone. but And they know that. But you have to break it down sometimes. Does the, fit, does the food fit the plate? This is a beautiful, and this is reality. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to share with you all the mistakes I've made. Because I think over 35 years, I've made a full slot of them. And I and I was not doing it on purpose, but I was doing it because perhaps I was naive. This is a piece of Dover sole. And this was a fish item that we served at our restaurant. That's a 14 inch plate. So when the plate came down, the customer, the guy next to the person started making fun of him because he said, Where's the rest of your food? Chefs, professionals, when you decide to go for China, please make sure that you have to understand, can I afford to? Because in this case, we probably should have put two more pieces of fish on there. Can I afford two more pieces of Dover sole? Not everybody is just looking at it the way we look at it. So you have to look at that. But does the food fit the plate? And it's a real picture is worth a thousand again, as I as I just mentioned. Inconsistent expectations. I made this for breakfast for a group one time, and I, I I'm still employed uh, because I'm I'm surprised I got out of it okay. And that was scrambled eggs under gold leaf with caviar and some toast. And my point to it is I use this as an analogy of. Am I writing things on the menu that people are expecting to see? If you tell me scrambled eggs and toast with a little bit of caviar on gold, you might think that the rim of the plate is gold, that this scrambled eggs are there, that it's going to be a nice piece of toast that I can put the scrambled eggs, and then, okay, caviar is a little wild. But in, in case, but look at it. Do you make what the customer expects? And I use this as a picture of a thousand words is I have done several of these car crashes in my life thinking that I was the most creative person and it had nothing to do with what they were expecting to see. Um, I served this at a board committee meeting and and OK, they 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 made fun of it and they a few of them aided and so forth. But my point was, I will make sure that what is on the menu is expected. And that it's what you have in mind. Menu realities when chefs are making menus, remember the client is aging today. Do you know that the fastest growing section of wealth is 70 year old now? Not the emerging wealth, the generational wealth of 45 to 55, but 70-year-olds. So they're living longer, thank goodness. We will all live longer. So are you are you aware of the, what they eat and how they eat? Ingredients, we talked about Escoffier. 
if there's one thing you get out of this this conversation today is do not buy four ingredients, please, ladies and gentlemen. Now, if you can't afford it, okay. If the, the application is okay. But if you have a choice, buy great product. Offerings, regional, identifiable, profitable, and classics. Identifiable, we just talked about with the caviar. Regional, I serve, I'm in Cleveland, and if I serve a fish fry, people know what that means on Friday night. I don't have to reinvent it. It's like happy hour. Classics, classic flavors, clam chowder, onion soup. People like certain flavors, tomato soup. People like certain flavors, Caesar salad. Deconstruct a Caesar salad and it tastes terrible because you have some anchovy, you have some raw garlic, you have some olive oil, you have some little bit of vinegar or lemon, you have a little bit of salty Parmesan cheese, and you have some dried out croutons and some watery lettuce. Put it all together and it's beautiful. Classic items. Deconstruction. Understand that everybody has allergens today. So the more you can alaminute your items, toss them in a bowl, long gone or chicken salad where the prepared item is. And then maybe because people are going to say, well, I don't eat celery and I don't eat onions. So make sure that you're building your menus. Diets and they merge allergens, trends, disease, fads. Foodies are only 1%. People that call themselves foodies, I'm always a little bit leery of because what that really means is I like what I liked. Foodies are people who love the art of food and will try things open-minded, love the discovery of food. Most people describe themselves as a foodie is, I like to eat, but I like what I want. That's not really a foodie in the sense. That's an individual preference or an opinion. Uh, generational members, we talked about that opening up in the beginning, which is that there's a granddaughter there, a, 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 a daughter-in-law and so forth. Individualized portions. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're still doing an entremet or a tort, and you're still putting it out there so that the, the 12th slice is all beaten up, and you're expecting somebody to be excited about it. Individual portions. Tapas have done it. Appetizers have done it. Now buffets are doing it. People want their own little piece of entremet or bonbon or chocolate. They don't want to follow and hand, have something handled by someone else. It is something that has taken shape over the last 20 years. Popular items. Chefs, you'll all smile. But these are trends and these are fads and these will be around forever. Soup. People love soup. Culturally, whether it be a faux, whether it be a hot and sour, whether it be New England, whether it be, they love it. Beef, filet, short rib strips, secondary cuts, seafood, salmon, whitefish, regional, poultry, chicken. If you would, I always tell young chefs, if you'll just put these items on your menu and create around these, you will probably satisfy 75 to 80% of the people who are eating in your organization. 85% of the people will be happy if you play with these items and create around those you will, but you must have beef. Now you say, well, where's the pork, Lawrence? Yes, you can put pork. Where is the lamb? Okay, you can put lamb. What I'm saying is these are the items that sell the most regionally and nationally on all menus. And so if you start there, you have a chance of, and so if you don't want people to deconstruct your product, put on there, the majority of what they eat, and you're halfway there, which is also great menu engineering. Plan for deconstructions, allergens, trends. I've already talked about that. It's kind of cute here. It says, um, how would you like the alphabet soup? Would you like it in certain certain type of font? You know, of course, it's funny, but that's where we have gotten. 
I will say it again, world-class purveyors work with world-class chefs. Do you know, ladies and gentlemen, that there are people out there that will not sell their product to a chef who doesn't know what to do with it? If I'm talking to Eliza and Lamb, or if I'm talking to Brown Trade, or if I'm talking to about a sea urchin, there are people that will say, what are you going to do with my baby? What are you going to do with our product? Great chefs, when, I, when I'm always telling a club or an organization to hire a great chef, I'm saying, do you understand the fraternity of greatness in purveyors, in product, in technique, in disciples? But this is a beautiful, beautiful example of Mother Nature, caviar, sea urchin, scallops. You don't need to do much more. But there are purveyors who will not sell to you if you don't know what you're doing with it. And I can't underestimate the importance of the young chefs out there learning and working with masters in order for you to have the privilege to purchase from some of these people. When I was in the Greenbrier in 85, I bought product later on as an executive chef that I was introduced to at that great resort. And that's what purveyors do. Purveyors give great organizations great product because they want the disciples to carry that to other organizations in the future. Inspected by Charlie, vendor, just validation. I, I would just, I, I could go on stories about David Boulay's restaurant in the 1980s, where you would walk in and smell the apple orchard at the at the hostess stand, and the smell of a fragrant apple or a fermenting apple got you started for dinner. Um, and I've I've had I've had vendors come and inspect my kitchen before they would sell to them, and I've got great examples of that. Um, and it was my first aha that if I don't take care of your product, you're not interested. Um, Architectural storyboards. So one of the greatest things that general managers ask me all the time is, how do I create and how do I keep the chef creative but not stifle his creativity? And so I create an architectural storyboard of culinary scenes, traditional events. Chef, please leave certain traditional events alone. Menus. Let's look at the data and we can do, we can, I want you to keep two thirds of the menu the same and, and play with a third of it. Auspicious occasions, celebrate whatever the wine tastings or whatever like that chef, you can do whatever you want to there. Comfort zones, there are certain things on a bar that need to stay where they need to stay because people are comfortable ordering it. Guest chefs and speakers, Go ahead and do whatever. And as soon as I tell the chefs that work with me where they can play and where they need to leave it alone, I protect them first. Because when people don't like the food, they come to the chef first and then they come to the general manager second. And the general manager could say, well, he won't listen to me or she won't listen to me. Or they could say, I've told them exactly where to play, and I've told them where they need to stay the same. And that is the business-centric part of the strategy. So any of you understand you're not going to have full autonomy. There are very few, and I just saw the beautiful film Love, Charlie, and I have so much respect for Charlie Trotter, who was in 1980, my hero, as he did it. And Charlie was probably one of the few that could play with whatever he wanted to because he was so far thinking with the degustation menus. But I bet if you tell Daniel Ballou, if you ask Thomas Keller, if you ask some of the greatest chefs out there, Wolfgang Puck, they'll say, there are items I can't take off my menu, nor would I dare, because this is what has built my brand. I think of the cornet with um, salmon tartare. I could imagine Thomas is probably tired of making those, but nobody ever got tired of eating those. Be careful, ladies and gentlemen. So as chefs, produce and keep on cooking what people love and then play on the other side of it. 
and teach the disciples that are working for you the centric part of business. Understand that children's food, I had a great, I just wrote an article about a kitchen design, and I remember 22 years ago getting a grilled cheese sandwich without, grilled, without cheese. So I quickly said, so you want toast? No, 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 no. They're lactose intolerant. Okay. So children and that five-year-old child at the pool at the Ritz-Carlton in Naples when I was there is now 30. And they're having children of their own. So children, generationally, children have grown up deconstructing their food. So children's food is deconstructed too. Or they have the same beliefs in their menus. They've been taught. So it's no longer eat what's on your plate back in the generational day. It is eat what you'd like and let me know what you want and customize it. So understand this is not going to change, ladies and gentlemen. We need, this is a trend and a fad that will stay here forever. And that is the young diners want what they want. Desserts. When I went to China, I moved to China in 2011. And I always thought that the Chinese menus were strange because they had pictures. But I didn't, I didn't really make, I didn't make the analogy that so does um, McDonald's, Burger King. Why do you think that? Why do you think that there's pictures? Because this picture of a beautiful opera cake, if I could have put it on my club menu, would have sold 10 times more than the description. I'm not, I'm not advocating that you put pictures on your menu. What I'm advocating is that you use subliminal marketing in menu pictures throughout your organization. But the Chinese have pictures so that they can see what the dish looks like. And when I lived in China for five years, I found it very comforting very quickly going, okay, that's what the Peking duck's going to look like. That's what the noodle is going to look like. That's what the portion is going to look like. Use pictures subliminally and strategically. Your career, author your story. Author your story. There is a chemistry in the brain, and oxytonin is the effect of taking care of others. So when you write a thank you note to someone, so we've got endorphins and serotonins. There's chemicals in the brain. There's an oxytonin effect. When I take care of someone, when I write a thank you note, when I serve something to someone, when I cook for somebody, there is a chemical dump in my brain. And that's what I think that the great chef was saying when he says that the industry selects us is it's that dope. When I take care of somebody, when I create a great dish, I get a rush when I serve it to someone. And that's why I like to see someone else eat it better than I do. And every one of you can relate to this. And that's the oxytonin effect in your brain. When you write a thank you card, a first class card, when you appreciate something, when you shake someone's hand, these are all chemical dumps in the brain. And that comes with our great career. So author your story. But you're so fortunate that you're in an industry where we can take care of others and gift our craft to others. What is your why? Simon Sinek. I highly recommend listening to any of Simon Sinek's books. He talks about as soon as you know what your why is, it helps you. I also believe in purpose, and purpose equals joy. If you know what your purpose is in life, ladies and gentlemen, you will have joy, not happiness. Happiness is fleeting. Joy. And that's why I have been privileged since I arrived at 17 never to have worked a day in my life. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't have difficult days. That didn't mean that I wasn't suffering physically or mentally as I left on days. 
But if you know what the why is, why do you do what you do? And that also has to do with those characteristic traits that we talked about in selecting the interview. Now we know about the chemistry. Can you see how this all starts to come together? If I select the right person who has the right character, who knows what they want to do, who never counted an hour, that gets excited when they with a chemical dump, we're halfway there in the process. And that's why people will say, I will work 10 hours a day if I have a cause, a purpose, because I love it. Now, that doesn't mean you take advantage of them. That doesn't mean that you work them relentlessly. That doesn't mean, but understand, you can start to see the, pe the puzzle come together when you talk about this. What is your calling? I have reinvented myself five times. Now I'm in a new reinvention. When you, when, when I arrived at 17, nobody would have ever told me I would ever leave the kitchen. At 36, I left the kitchen. Then at 40, I left the general manager's position. Then I moved over to Asia. And now I went to general management. And then I went to, and I went to, and I went to, and I've reinvented myself. Why? Because I wanted different problems. I got tired of having the same problems or the premonition of an industry. So I created and reinvented problems. But professional, many of you will no longer be a chef someday. There's nothing wrong with that. Grow to become an assistant F&B, an F&B, an assistant general manager, a general manager, a president of organization, a president of a school, a professor. We have great opportunities, There's a, but that comes with lifetime learning. In order to reinvent yourself, you have to continue to educate and grow. It's not going to be given to you just because you're standing there working hard. You have to provide another organization something. And what is the value proposition of that organization that you can provide to them? It's a strategy, lifetime learning, which then gives you provider for yourself because if you move up, there's a good chance economically you will move up too. Menus and careers migrate. MLK said it the best, a genuine leader is not a searcher of consensus, but a molder, molder of consensus. What is the consensus of your menus? What is the consensus of your career? And that is a shaping and it's alive. It never changes. If you think you're going to arrive at the executive chef's role and nothing is going to change in the industry, problems are going to dissolve, then you become institutionalized. You cannot become institutionalized. Our industry is vibrant. It's growing. It's changing. The problems are going to be more challenging. But take a look at those and say, I am ready for those challenges. It helped me in 2004. I'm looking over Victoria Harbor in Hong Kong. I've just come out of the Rapungi district where I was the corporate chef doing a kitchen renovation. And they spoke in such language to me. And they, they called it estimators. And they were estimating the cost of the kitchen. And they needed to find $300,000 that I needed to find in the kitchen of the project. And I didn't know the language they were talking. And then one day I was doing a um, some research about something. And the Harvard Business Journal said that you will relearn your career four times. You will reinvent required to stay relevant. And it took so much pressure off me. So all of you who think you don't know the answers, it's okay. You're right in the right audience. You don't, you're not supposed to know all the answers and you will learn them if you stay in another group that's talking a language that you don't understand. If you stay in the language that you understand, you're probably not going to grow as great as staying in a language that you don't understand and you look up. Seek to understand before being understood. That goes back to what we're talking about a little bit of seeking your staff just because you learned it this way. I'm really disappointed sometimes when some people talk about the generation today doesn't have the work ethics of tomorrow. It's a different priority. That's all. 
But the talent and the exposure of those ladies and gentlemen coming out of school is at a very, very, very high level. Now we just need to figure out how do we how do we do that? How do we enhance that? How do we harness harness that challenge? And journey toward change is the responsibility of every leader. Whenever a leader tells me that they have that the young youth today don't have the same dedication, I'll ask them one simple question. Have you taken time off? Are you in retirement? Did you feel when you got to 50 that you could coast? Because what I found is most of the leaders that are really driving hard continuously are the ones that the disciples want to work with. So often I just ask them quietly, are you still pushing? Well, I don't have time for that. Are you still doing that? Well, I was thinking about it. Well, if I had, and if I had, and if I had, and I wonder to myself, okay, so maybe that's why the youth, the, the most talented youth, may be not seeking your guidance or direction. So seek to understood of yourself before understanding others. Marketing, the greatest ideas are never known often. Does the customer know what you have to sell? One of the greatest pieces is a chef that says, well, it didn't sell. And you ask him, well, who knew about it? Well, I told them about it. I told them, I told the, the, the waiter, okay, did the waiter taste it? Well, no, no, I don't know. Well, they didn't like it. Okay. Well, did you market it? Did you write it there? Well, we, we do a simplified menu. So often I'll ask a chef, did you want the item sold? Were you so passionate about it that you actually walked out to the in the dining room and actually told some of the customers, hey, listen, I'm the chef. I just want to let you know that I just got this amazing fish in, this halibut, and you got to have it tonight. Or did you leave it in the hands? So marketing is all about different platforms of communication. Here's one. Picture is worth a thousand words. Marketing to me on my ter on, on, on my terms. So that means the survey says, meaning surveying your customers, full time, no maybes. I love when people say we should have a social media presence. If they're not going to dedicate 12 to 24 hours a day on social media, don't even go into it. It moves so fast. All of you know that because you flip through your phones every single day. If the club or the organization doesn't move at light speed, go find another channel because you're not going to find satisfaction there. Discipline channels. Decide what channels you want to communicate on. Icons, and I'm going to show you some icons, engage very, very well. People want to see pictures and things quicker than words. If you have more than a few words, Hence why this PowerPoint basically is a bunch of different things. I try to mix it up so that you can look at all the different font, look at the cartoons, look at the pictures. That's actually a port. That's wine in the back. I play with your eyes so that you're entertained, so that potentially you'll hear the message. Um, print versus vigil, and then annual calendars be there first. Data. So speed to market, four scenes, we'll talk about member event surveys, preference or a problem. Often people will say, I didn't like that. And I'll say, well, you didn't like it because we didn't prepare it or you don't like it because it's just a preference or an opinion. And that's OK. You can have one. And the example I use is a person said to me one time in a business club, they said, Lawrence, breakfast was slow. And I just asked a simple question, who did you dine with? Because if you dined with your mother, breakfast could take all the time in the world because I love eating with my mom. If you're eating with an adversary, I could never have been fast enough. And I, I didn't mean the fact I'll go back and look at micro sales and I'll go back and look at how fast it took. And remember, I told you that if something can't be from fire to 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 plate or service in eight minutes, you're probably lost. But my point was. 
were they eating with somebody they weren't comfortable with? Because if they were eating with somebody they were comfortable with, it couldn't have ever come fast enough. And my analogy was you've got to look at all the different scenes, not just one or another. Without documented data is just an opinion. Chef, please, if you can do one thing for me, professionals, don't start with I, I think this. Just say, these were our sales. Share with your, your customers, here's what's sold. It helps me often when Mrs. Smith loves her salad and I show Mrs. Smith that she's the only one that did love her sal salad in, in sales. Oh, wow, I didn't realize nobody else liked my salad. It doesn't hurt the pain, but it hurts the reality that she may not press it as much next time if it finds its way migrating off of the menu. So we put the items that are sell, that's that two thirds rule. Your data should tell you really what sells so popular and then play with a third of it. Digital, open ratio. If you do a, a survey for your guests or you, there are analytics that show you open ratios. So did people open up your advertisement, your email blast, um, and so forth like that? Who are you talking to? So one of the things that we always worked on was a seamless connection that if we promoted a bourbon and steak thing, we also put the link for reservations right there. All of you know this. If you've ever tried to do anything on your phones, you want to make sure that there's a seamless process right through the process. You don't want to have to go back and figure out through three screens how I make or order this. If you're ordering something on Amazon, haven't you noticed that everything's right there and they make it so easy that they stole the money out of your pocket? They make it so simple. Well, you have to do the same thing when you're marketing to your customers or members. Is Here's the bourbon. Here's the price. Here's the link. Confirmation of the reservation. And it's a seamless process. But who are you communicating to? We also would do surveys on people who went to the events so that we would market to the same people, just like all of you do with analytics. Don't touch anything today in analytics if you don't plan to see it for the next week. If you just look on something, it says, oh, you're interested, and they give you five things to look at. We did the same thing at the club. If somebody was and loved a certain event, we would market to them because we knew that they liked it. Here's an example of how we would evaluate and share with us our F Facebook analytics. Suggestion boxes are really, it, they're really out of date today. What do you want somebody to do with the suggestion? And what are you supposed to do with it? So surveying, survey monkey and stuff is much, much quicker. Engagement is a timeless issue. Look at the analogy here in 1916, they were all lined up reading newspapers. Now, so whenever anybody tells me, you know, all the youth are on their phones, I could say all their grandfathers were on their newspapers. I mean, it's the same scenario. It hasn't changed. See how a picture helps the perception. Explore feedback and preferences, all different ways. Get get feedback from your from your from your members. Here's a top seven. Here are the questions we would ask after an event. We never asked, was it too salty? We would ask overall satisfaction. How did you learn about the event? Would you attend more of these events? Did culinary offerings meet the club standards? Not your expectation, the club standard. Because we might have something on there that you don't like. I just really didn't like that. Okay, there's not a lot I can do about that. But was it, if you said, Lawrence, it was ice cold, the stuff was garbage, and it was unedible, that didn't meet our club standards. Okay, now I can do something with it. We stayed away from seasoning, temperature, and portion, because most of those are all personalized. But you can see how we would do our top seven, and that's all we would ask them. And then we would collect this database, and then the next event, we would go in and see if we're going on the right on the right path. Comment cards of today, this was an example. 
of one of those open ratios. And we had about a 30, 33% open ratio, which meant that we were touching the majority of the people. Reinventing events. We had Top Chef. We would use, uh, if, if we do something chopped food network or Top Chef, we don't have to, it's like happy hour. We don't have to subscribe. This case, in this case, uh, Chef Dante was a local chef's hero that a lot of our members went to. So we invited him to our events. Static, we talk about visual. You can see that. Um, see how much important static is. People look at, oh, that looks nice. That looks interesting. People do not want to read words. They want to see images. Again, chopped competition, cocktail competition, chef's we would be 100, 120 days out from an event and start to really push it. Collision marketing, I learned this from um, the CEO, Zappos, Tony. Um, he would say, put things, so we wrapped water bottles with food and beverage events. We put them in cars. We hung them from, from their mirrors. We put them in anywhere in the elevators, anywhere they came, we would put something in their hands that had some type of marketing about food and beverage. We had a we had a beautiful magazine, and one of our magazines, one of our chapters always was cuisine scene. And that was every single issue was a message from chef and what was going on in food and beverage. We did fitness finesse, we did cult, cult, uh, culture club, we did all kinds of different things, but we would have fun with um, beverage and cuisine scene and so forth like that. Here is the icons that I talked to you about as far as marketing those icons. Um, see how much easier it is to see Cuvée Club. It's a wine club. Okay, now I can. So if I see that and there's a little description, I can invest in reading it. If I'm not interested in it, I move on to the next thing. For fit, it's not forgotten. We would have fresh fruit in our in our um, fitness areas, selling what what we picked up, um, different different um, fruits and vegetables and so forth like that. This was one of our most. It was every Friday night a table is set for twelve, and then we would ask, "Are you brave enough to taste excellence?" And this was our chef's table. Every Friday night, a table is set for 12. Are you brave enough to taste excellence? Not do you want fish or beef, but do you want to taste excellence? It was a subliminal piece. There was the chef's picture, and this was, this was our chef's table. The restaurant. Can a member describe it? The biggest challenge... That's why steakhouses do so well, ladies and gentlemen. Most of you can describe a steakhouse. Well, you're going to have some steaks. You're going to have a tomato salad. You're going to have a Caesar. You're going to have a wedge salad. You're going to have an onion soup or something. And they can almost tell you. You're going to have creme brulee. There's probably a bread pudding, a hot liquid, chocolate liquid. You can almost describe it. Can people describe your restaurant? Here's some examples of some other food that we would do. Scenes. One time someone told me in a brand, I was running a large brand, they said, Lawrence, our service is slow. And I said, where? And they said, and so I broke it down into the arrival, pre-event, event, and post. The arrival is the hostess table setting and personal. That's the engagement. Pre-event, drinks, selection. And can you see how I do this in a stage of a, of a play? And this helps me. Then do I have a hostess issue? Do I have an engagement issue? Do I have an execution to the table issue? Do I have a delivery of product, the event phase, which is getting it there? Or do I have, all of you have been held hostage by the check on occasion where the check didn't come. So do you see how I broke this down? And this helps when people say we have slow service. I can go in and say, let me look at each one of the, remember I told you about breaking down bite-sized pieces to the process. I call these the big four. Authentic. Authentic are restaurants today. Grab and go, zoning, 
Booth is still king. Fire is the new water. Back in the day, every one of you would have gone into an old building and there would have been a waterfall. Now it's fire in most cases. There's a lot of mystery etched glass. You like to see shadows behind it. Um, bar is the hub today. So it really hangs. Before the bar used to be off to the edge and smoky. Now the bar is right in the middle. It's the energy piece. Um, grab and go has a portion in almost every restaurant now, not just because of the pandemic, but long before the Starbucks culture created that. So, chairs. Um, I won't get into this, but please, before you buy a chair, and the wind theory was that Mr. Wynn was known for sitting in every single one of the chairs in every single one of his casinos. I have left some dinosaurs behind, unfortunately. Make sure the chair fits the table. Make sure the chair fits the person. Make sure the chair is not so comfortable they never leave, but so uncomfortable they never want to stay. And so you have to look through that process and make sure that check the chair and don't underestimate the importance of a chair, a simple chair. The bar, anticipation of needs is the number one, speed. Drinks are profitable. Non-drinks are actually going up in sales. So what type of bar are you? Are you a staging? Are you a second choice? Are you a destination? Or are you a zoned? What type of bar are you? And you, it's interesting when I talk to people about this, is it a staging area where you arrive for a drink and then go to the room? Are you a second choice, which means that the restaurant is full and now we're sitting at the bar? Is it a destination, which is eat, drink, and entertain almost like a sports bar? Is it zone timed, meaning that I come there for lunch, happy hour, or maybe I catch an after dinner? Isn't it interesting that a lot of people will say, well, we're a little bit of everything. I understand. But do you see where the themes and the great bars know exactly who they are? Steps of service in a bar. If the bartender or the server doesn't make eye contact in five seconds of you arriving, you've lost the customer. Marking of the cocktail napkin or an identification, which in 20 seconds, I'm going to get you. Execution of the drink within one minute. Anticipation of another drink while it is almost two thirds anticipation. So a third is still left. And then billing built in service or open tab. All of you have been there where the bar has the your your receipt right there in the glass or it's there by or it's on a tab. Do you understand how all of these sciences work for your satisfaction at the bar and often in organizations we we think well they're looking for more. No, these are the needs that are being met. And if you meet these net, just like I was talking about the items in a menu, if you meet these five things, you have a half better chance of having a full bar. If you miss all of these, there's a chance people will find somewhere else to go. Wine pitfalls. I wish people would just buy wine people want to drink. Awards, fads, sommelier, and ego, and bottle size often leave large sellers behind. Most of the sellers that I inherited, I had to kind of have a fire sale because we built over because we wanted spike. So be careful that people buy what they can describe, varietals that they know, things that they're comfortable with, middle of the range price, not the highest one, not the lowest one, the middle price. Wine turnover, inventory wine turnover should be two and a half times. The average range in wine pricing is $5, believe it or not. The top wine, white wine is Chardonnay, whether you like it or not. Top red wine is Merlot, believe it or not. The average wine pour size is six ounces. Wine glass is two thirds full, and the most popular spirit is three to one vodka to anything else. And Tito's has killed it. So my point to you is, when we go into an organization and we talk to them about their wine, and they tell us it's different, 
I'll say, okay, but let's just make sure that you have some of these things on your menu because you're halfway there. I'm not saying your club is different. I'm not saying the club or the organization wants to do a nine ounce pour or it's okay, fine. But it's best to know what the what the national average is so that you can go in with that process. Bartenders. Bartenders are the biggest influencers in the club. They can make your food. They can break your food. They can make your beverage. They can break it. They can make and they make and break your general manager in some cases. It is amazing the power that these people have while they're pouring spirits to other people is that they will actually believe everything that's being said during the trans transaction. And so my point to that is keeping your bartenders educated, informed. They can be your greatest PR piece and they can be, I don't know, I never heard about that before. Or yes, I got to tell you about this special or yes, our chef just got this award or yes, in the process. These will not change. Bar snacks, why, what, when, where, and worth it? Absolutely. There's a reason people put salty things on bar, and that is to consume more product. And so bar snacks always are in the best interest of the organization. And it gives people a feel that why do we still fly on airplanes and they give us those little pretzels? Because the, 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 the airports are full of beautiful food, beverage, that we could take on the plane. But because it's still there, it's a tradition. Our snacks are a tradition. Anticipation will reward. So with the bar, measurement is a recipe and a philosophy. Do they follow the recipe? Can't see what you don't what you don't see in display. Believe it or not, that most great bars sell space in some of the casinos, so people will look at bar and they'll believe in and they'll buy spirits that are that are um, buy wine that sells rather than the sommeliers curses turnover. We talked a little bit about that anticipation. These are true trends in the area. Catering. What is the event's mission? The event's mission usually is a platform, which is the bride, an anniversary party, the PowerPoint presentation, the rollout of a strategy, celebration of a business. business. It's not the food. The food can distract, but what is the mission each time with catering? Food has to be outstanding, but it cannot take the place of what is the mission of people gathering? And people gather in larger groups than eight or 10 for a reason. And it's a celebration. And so food has to meet that celebration. Catering. Skirts are gone on tables. People, Martha did it years ago. Cook to order, we talked about. Brides rule. Tastings. Um, most brides are told now that they have to have two or three tastings. If you're tired of that, then get out of the business because it is sense of place. When you go, when it when an event comes to your area, do they get a tasting of the local feel? Themed bar setups, my own portion, we talked about that. Speed for success, meaning uber organized. Flavor, uh, uh, favorable flow, meaning that if you do have a buffet, that it's spread out. And so people are not waiting in line. Nobody wants to. Never the last portion. And then in this case, I was talking about um, a bride having, we used to give a bride a, a, a gift for a celebration on the day of her wedding. Um, it was just a surprise. It's kind of the happy meal of McDonald's. Um, overwhelmed is the new orange. So buffets now are looking at it going, I don't even know where I start. I don't even know what I want. Um, I don't even know what that is but it looks so good, I'm going to try it. Now you say, what about allergens and stuff? Absolutely. You have to have an education, maybe a sign in the process. But we're talking luxury here in most cases where people are like, they paid to have this opulence. Martha had it right all those years. Martha taught us to cook in front of everyone, cook to order. Her greatest arrival in the 80s and 90s was 
It's no longer in a chafing dish. It's now cooked to order, which I think has just been wonderful. And that was the emergence of Martha. That was the emergence of, of um, the Food Network and uh, Julia Childs. And, and of course, now you just everything, even, even uh, malls have cooked to order stations. Now everything, Starbucks, everything is, everything is rolled Chipotle. Look at that. Um, Mom told me not to share, meaning that I want my individual. See how an entremet looks so much better when it's an individual portion. And I also feel from a food safety point of view that, um, but I want my own item. I want my own. Another one here. And believe it or not, now with all the great development of pastry, um, back in the day, in the early late 90s when we were at this, we had to cut things. Now everything is shaped with silk hats and so forth like that. So everybody's gotten into it. But you can see the beautiful, doesn't this look better than three different portions in the process? And I would like to thank you. I, I hope that in this case, we talked about what are you as a leader? What are the trends? Who's your customer? And we go through all of these processes so that you feel comfortable. But these are some of the trends that I wanted to share with you um as we um as i as i shared with you today and i'm honored to be a part of this process with the acf and indebted to the acf for everything that they've done for my certification and what i can do for them in the future and i would just like to thank you for your gracious um attendance wow that was amazing thank you so much chef um so much great information and i i already know everyone's gonna have to watch it all over again just to take even more notes from all of the uh, the great tips and advice we do have several questions if you're so willing to take sure. um, a okay. couple of questions from the audience um one of the chefs has written and said um in regards to best practices for hiring and interviewing should they hire and train or wait for the perfect, most qualified candidate, because these are a little bit of trying times right now with staffing. You know, there's, it's a great question. And, and what I've always hired, I've hired somebody, all right, it depends on the position. So if it's an entry level position, I hire for attitude. And in many cases, chefs say, I'd like to train and teach. Do I, do I turn around some bad, bad practices? Okay, that's the half class, half empty or whatever. But you have to hire talent for the areas that are talent. So what I used to always say was, I was the fourth, fourth, fourth most talented person in my kitchen. My pastry chef was better than me. My fine dining chef was better than me. My, my, my classic chef was better than me. My, because they were paid to put out a better product, I was paid to lead as the executive chef. If it's an entry level, I always like to just hire someone with a great attitude and let me help them mentor through the process. Wonderful. Thank you. Very, very wise words. Another uh, chef who's tuning in is saying they're thinking of making the move into private clubs, and they're wondering if there are some key skills that are needed coming from a restaurant into a club environment. So what I always advise them is to tell the story that they were personalized. So the biggest thing that private clubs feel is different is you don't understand us, or you don't owe, you don't understand our club, or you don't understand our culture. If you take the same personalized experience, Mr. and Mrs. Smith used to come in my restaurant all the time, or they came into our hotel and I created a relationship with them. And then on Sunday brunch, I used to cook these things for them and I used to take care of them. Or I would, if you can personalize your hospitality at any level, it will relate better to the private club business. Will you ever know their culture? No. Will you ever know their, their restrictions? No. Um, but if you can take that same personalized hospitality and explain it in the interview process, um, it will help you with their understanding of you. The second piece is that excellence or culinary excellence is the same regardless. So if you're putting out great food in your restaurant, share with them the disciples you worked for, share with them where you learned how to cook, share with them how you evaluate your success in the process, and um, it should seamlessly translate. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, another question is um, from a chef who says they've been recently promoted to an executive chef role due to the chef leaving and being short staffed. So they're wondering um, if you have any tips on how to change from a colleague into the leader of the kitchen. Yeah, that's that's a great. Well, first of all, congratulations on having the emotional intelligence to even realize that you moved. I do a whole thing on what 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 I call a lieutenant and a and a, um, a lieutenant and a um, and a general, and that and that's really there. So there's a lot of different paradigms. Which is, I do the task, but I don't have the responsibility that the general has or the emotional stress of the general man. But I do the task that they're responsible for. Um, the other piece, which is really interesting, which is the piece that they've spoken about here, is is that sociology and psychology of how do I become the friend and now I'm responsible for it? I would say that while it's wonderful that you took on the responsibility, I would tell you that there's nothing like going into an organization as the executive chef. And so while you may be successful in this current role, it's ideal that you find a role in the future where you are the original executive chef because the subconscious of all the people you work with, you can influence them, but it's not going to change. They're always they're always going to see you as a certain person within the caste system of, of the organization. Um, and I've, I've done that. I've come in behind executive chefs. We, we, we hire a lot of executive chefs where the executive chef becomes a director of food and beverage. And we tell the executive chef, are you okay with this person being in the role? The poor executive chef who became a director of food and beverage in the same club is still referred to as chef. There are certain paradigms that just don't change. And so a lot of what this individual is asking me about, or you're asking us about sociology and the psychology of it, it's not going to change with the title. And so sometimes it, it's really eventually you'll find freedom in moving into another role. All right, wonderful advice. Um, another question is um, asking if you have any examples or what you might suggest to reward or recognize hardworking team members. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we had so many things. Um, we had um, what we called a single out program. So everybody had the right to single out someone else every single day, 30 days, 30 days a month, if they saw somebody do something above and beyond or help lateral service. We would put that in a basket at the end of the month and we would draw out um, gift cards, $25, $50. To it. Um, every one of the um, line staff and managers were responsible for goals. And every one of their goals was a personal goal and a professional goal. And one of those goals was education. So we required everybody to be a part of an association. Um, they would all be responsible for going somewhere and doing something, um, being participating in some type of educational learning. Um, so that's another piece. Um, recognition and reward of gatherings. Um, while I didn't, I didn't subscribe to after hour gatherings, we would have um, we would have um, employee meetings every single, uh, or, or in this case, maybe you have a quarterly sous chef meeting um, or a culinary meeting, excuse me, and somebody cooks dinner, you get together and you celebrate um, all of them um, together um, on property um, somewhere so that it's controlled, no alcohol involved in, in those types of things. Um, but there's all types of different record, um, first class cards or thank you cards. Um, giving your team um, uh, printed cards that are somewhere where they can go and get them at the chef's office and write, I, I, you really did a great job. Thank you. That's kind of the singled out, uh, singled out program. But where people can thank others professionally, um, we had a book club where we would give books to um, uh, people who got the most singled out and they would get a cookbook every year, every apprentice and internship or every J1 or H2B got a culinary book from us as a thank you and everybody signed it because that was forwarding their, their craft forward. Um, so there were all kinds of different ways to, the, the key is to recognize people every single day 
Um, we had another another kitchen I saw recently had um, the chef of the week, and they had a history or a bio on an executive chef that was an icon in the industry up at the um, well, well it's, it's I'm going to sound old, but time clock, but somewhere where they come in and they they log in. And they would have it up on the bulletin board and it would tell the history of a Gordon Ramsay or a Marco Pierre White or Daniel Blue or whatever. And it was a way of, of a meet and greet um, lineups and so forth like that um, every day. So all different types of things, yes. Great suggestions. Um, we have another chef who looks up to you quite a bit, like so many tuning in, and they're wondering if you might share um, if you had a, a most important career decision that changed your trajectory in order to set you up for all the success that you've had. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the one that I thought was probably the biggest challenge for me. I was 36 years old and I was corporate chef for Ritz Carlton. And I thought to myself, I arrived at my dream job too early. And so was I going to spend 25 years as corporate chef of Ritz Carlton? Or was I going to go and um, uh, reinvent myself? Um, I also realized um, economically, I was a master chef and I was corporate chef for Ritz Carlton. The chance of me making a lot more money in our in my industry um, at this level with these two titles was probably limited. So I decided to take a step back and become a director of food and beverage because what my predecessors had always told me is, Lawrence, you need to know garmage, you need to know banquets, and then you need to know before you can be an executive sous chef. So I did the same thing, and I went back and stepped back to be director of food and beverage. I took a, not only took a salary decrease, but I moved over. But then I shot forward as a hotel manager, vice president of food and beverage, and then on to owner and so forth. And it shot me straight forward, and now I then I doubled my my economics. So. The moral of the story is I left I left my biggest shift at the top of my career for an unknown, which was to go to the front of the house. And it took me almost four years to find the same satisfaction in the front of the house that I found in the kitchen because my ego would not allow me to relearn so many things because I love the jacket and I love the title chef. And so I think that that was probably the greatest change for me and if I hadn't done that, I don't know where I would be today. Um, so sometimes it just, it happens. Um, but you've got to reinvent yourself on the top, not on the way down. And I would always warn that to everyone is to continue to forge forward. Very, very inspiring. Thank you for that. And a culinary educator has submitted a question wondering if you have any advice for culinary students who are now just entering the industry who obviously dream to one day be a, a, a certified master chef? Well, I would say first is to listen to other people's opinions over yours. Um, that actually the mentor, this culinary instructor or mentors actually have your best interest in mind. Um, I will tell you that I was washing dishes at the Ramada Inn at, at 17 and they gave me a 25 cent raise and they wondered why I wouldn't why, why I wouldn't stay. That was the only person that didn't have my best interest in mind. Everyone else, my instructor took me to the Greenbrier. The Greenbrier took me to the Waldorf Astoria. The Waldorf Astoria took me to the, to the Ritz-Carlton. The Ritz-Carlton took me to the corporate office. Everyone else did it for me. I just had to put in the time and I just had to say yes. But everyone else had my succession plan planned out for me in the sense that they would say, Lawrence, go. And I wouldn't ask when or it didn't fit. Can't say that's for everyone. So as a young person, what I would say is, while there's insecurities of not knowing what to do, if you listen to the other people and if you do a great job, people will recognize and they will move you along um, if you provide the same value to the organization. Well, Chef, this has just been um, just so enlightening. And just to hear some of your wisdom, I'm sure the chef would love to stay on all day long and, and hear more. But um, do you have any final words or final thoughts that you'd like to leave the chefs who are tuning in or those who are watching the recording with their staff? 
No, I, I think that the people that are here today, the people that will listen to this later on, um, are those lifetime learners. Um, you're giving back to the industry. So I thank you for that. I'm humbled by that, that you would want to do that. Um, and just hopefully all the people that are involved enjoy what they do. Um, and if you have purpose, you have joy. And at the end of life, that's all we want is to be joyful um, in our in our pursuit um, of humanity. And so not to get uh, not to get too deep or anything, but just just enjoy what you do. Um, it's 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 a privilege to cook for others, to represent this craft and to represent everybody who came before us. And so with that, um, I wish everybody the best of luck as they continue to forge forward and our industry is in great hands. Well, thank you very, very much. This has just been a, a, a delight to learn more and a huge round of applause as we thank Master Chef McFadden for this wonderful presentation. And of course, for those of you tuning in, we appreciate you taking the, the uh, time to be here with us today. I know I've gained much from all of the important information and tips that Chef has shared with us. And the recording of today's session will be posted on the ACF Online Learning Center. So uh, don't forget, we have an action-packed week of demonstrations and presentations as we get ready to welcome you at ACF National Convention. And if you're planning to attend one of our summits, Chef McFadden will also be a presenter at the ACF Advanced Culinary Summit at the Breakers in Palm Beach. So we will see you tomorrow for our next webinar, free convention webinar on vegan cookery and competition techniques, followed by a session later this week on edible insects and a session on Italian gastronomy. We look forward to seeing you in New Orleans at ACF National Convention July 16th through the 19th. It's not too late to register and you don't want to miss it. We have amazing education and networking opportunities planned and we'd love to see you all there. In fact, we just announced our closing keynote will be Chef Dominique Krenn. And mark your calendars for those one day ACF Mastercraft summits being held across the country. We have designed specialized programming for culinary educators, for those interested in advanced culinary techniques, advanced pastry techniques. And if you're looking for a nutrition refresher for your certification, definitely join us for the Culinary Medicine Summit to be held on August 12th in Kalamazoo. So visit acfchefs.org and click on the events tab for more information or to register. So on behalf of the ACF National Office, thank you again to Master Chef McFadden for bringing up this great educational opportunity. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you soon.